ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له اشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان خير الحديث كتاب الله وخير الحدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار ثم اما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته Jazakallah like khair for everybody for joining. Uh, once again, alhamdulillah, barakallah feek. Another week has gone by and uh, we are all again together for one hour of remembering Allah. And inshallah, Allah will uh, have his angels surround us with sakina, inshallah. Um, we have been talking about the salah. And inshallah, today we will be continuing this topic. And there is a lot more to talk about still. Subhanallah, this this is something that we do every single day, minimum five times a day, and it is so absolutely critical that we understand it in depth and so that we can perform it to the best of our abilities. And why? So that we can get the most rewards possible, inshallah. Now, um, with, with this, we need to... Um, we need to make sure that we... are following the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and practicing uh, and implementing the salah in a manner which is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the only way to do that is to learn as to how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us is pleasing to him and the way that way is through the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and we always start with this hadith where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said pray as you have seen me praying and this is the foundation the fundamental of uh of why we need to learn the salah um alhamdulillah i'm sure all of us have been you know praying the salah uh, for for many years um some perhaps with more um let's say consistency than others but inshallah <clears throat> the point is is that we now make sure that we focus on this uh, in a manner which is pleasing to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so We're going to do a quick recap on on some of the points that we've done so far. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to unmute and ask, or um, you can type your question or raise your hand, whatever uh, you desire, inshallah. And so far, based on how the class has always gone, none of you desire to unmute and ask. You always type your questions, which is just fine, inshallah. But I would prefer uh, that I get a break from talking and you guys get to speak. But khair, inshallah. So... We know there are four elements of the of the salat that we are talking about. Uh, there are the sharut, which are the conditions or the prerequisites. There are the arkan, the pillars, the wajibat, which are the requirements, and the sunnah or the sunan, which is plural of sunnah, the sunan, uh, which are the recommended items um, or elements. We have gone through the sharut, the the uh, prerequisites or conditions in quite a bit of detail, so we're not going to recap on that. Uh, we have gone through the arkan the pillars as well and we're going to just quickly take a look and remind ourselves of what the pillars imply meaning that they are absolutely required in a salah if any pillar is left out for any reason whatsoever your salah is invalid and if you miss a pillar you cannot you cannot compensate for missing a pillar by the prostration of forgetfulness okay you must make up that pillar so that is um that is the 
foundation or the the explanation of what arkan is and the implication of what an arkan is and what are the arkan it is that you must be standing when you are in salah you must pronounce the takbiratul ihram the allahu akbar to start the salah you must recite surah al-fatiha Again, these are all, remember, we've talked about these, all of these elements in the Salah, the verbal elements are spoken. They are recited. They are something that comes with your tongue moving, your lips moving, and your breath uh, exhaling. They are not in the heart. They are not in the mind. Um, the ruku, the action of the ruku is from the pillars. Rising up from the ruku is from the pillars. The, uh, the sujood on the seven bones where the forehead and nose is considered one, both of your palms, both of your knees, and both of your feet. Rising up from the prostration, meaning into the sitting uh, sitting position or rising up into the standing position. Being tranquil and calm during every pillar position is an, act, is an absolute pillar. It is an arkan. So if you are not pausing uh, in every position, you are not performing them in a complete manner, then your salah, your entire salah becomes invalid. The pillars must be performed in order. The last tashahud, the attahiyat, is, is a pillar sitting sitting in the last tashahud, sending the salat and the salam on the Prophet sallallahu uh, alayhi wa in the last tashahud, and the two taslims saying assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. These are all from the requirements uh, of the, or sorry, the, the arkan, the pillars of the salah. And again, if any of these are missed, you must compensate them, not with just uh, two prostrations of forgetfulness, but you must compensate that action and then also perform the two uh, sujood for uh, forgetfulness. Um, I'm not going to read through this, but the the we went through this last week, I believe, or the week before. Uh, but the point or the summary of this is that if you do miss an arkan, ideally, you perform an extra raka. You do a complete raka to compensate for it, and you complete your salah by doing two um, uh, the two prostrations of forgetfulness, inshallah. Okay. So then we also spoke about the wajibat, the obligatory actions. So what is the difference between a pillar, uh, the arkan, and a wajibat, which is obligatory? Because isn't a pillar, the arkan, are they not obligatory? They are also obligatory, but the differentiation is what happens if you miss them. So they're both required, right? Pillars are required. And these wajibat are required. The difference is, is what happens if you miss them. So in a wajibat, if you miss something, um, your salah is still valid. Okay. And you can, you are allowed to compensate for that missed action with simply performing the two prostrations of forgetfulness. Okay, you don't have to perform an extra rakah or perform that action again. So this is the key differentiation between arkan, a pillar, and a wajibat, which is obligatory. And what are the wajibat actions? All of the takbirat, meaning all of the times that you say Allahu Akbar within the salah, <clears throat> except the takbirat al-ihram, because that is a pillar saying subhana rabbi al azim at least once at least once is required it is from the wajibat <clears throat> so is your salah valid if you go into ruku and say subhana rabbi al azim and then say sami allahu liman hamida yes your salah is valid is that the best way to do it no but it is it is a valid salah and it, you do not require prostration or forgetfulness if you do only one but that's not what we're encouraging you to do but it's something that we need to be aware of. Saying Sami Allahu liman hamida, saying Rabbana alaik alhamd, saying Subhana Rabbi al-Ala in sujood again at least once, saying Rabbi firli at least once in between the two sujood. So while you are sitting, and again, as I mentioned before, I think this is one of the things that is often overlooked in salah, and many people are not aware of this. So making sure that we uh, are putting this into practice. The first tashahud, so this is only obviously if you have 
um, three or more rakah. If it's a two rakah salah, then your first, there is no first tashahud, there is only the last tashahud. And the last tashahud is from the arkan, from the pillars. Um, and sitting down during the first tashahud. Okay, so these are the wajibat uh, or the obligatory actions. All right, and so let's just quickly recap again. Conditions are prerequisites for the salah. Your, your salah is invalid if you do not complete the or meet the prerequisites. They must be met. They must be met. Um, the pillars are those things that must be performed in the salah. And the wajibat are those things that must be performed, but if you miss them, then you can perform uh, the prostration of forgetfulness. Okay. We also spoke about this really quickly at the end of the last class, and I just want to go over this again in case it was too quick or if anybody has any questions. So if uh, you remember that you forgot one of the wajibat, so you're praying your salah and you remember all of a sudden, but you remember before you moved on to the next position of the salah, then you return and complete that which you left out. And that is it. You just continue the salah as regular. There is no prostration of forgetfulness. But if you have moved on to the next position, you do not go back. Okay, so let's say you go into sujood. It's uh, maghrib. We all just prayed maghrib, I believe. So we, you're in maghrib. And um, you're, you're in sujood. This is the second rakah. So when you come up from sujood, you should sit. For what? For a tahiyat. Because this is the first tashahud. And the first tashahud is from the wajibat. But instead, you start to stand up. If you have not fully stood up yet, you're still in motion of standing up and you remember you can sit down, recite at and continue your salah as normal and nothing different at all. No prostration of forgetfulness. However, if you have fully stood up and now you remember you haven't started even reciting Surat Al-Fatiha yet, but you have fully stood up then you do not go and sit down. You continue the salah, so you would start to recite Surah Al-Fatiha, and then you go into Ruku, and then you go into Sujood, and then once you complete the salah, um, you make your uh, prostration of forgetfulness. Okay? Um, and in this case, you would make it ideally before the, uh, before the Taslim. Okay. So that is a quick recap of uh, what we have been talking about so far, inshallah. Um, now let's dedicate the rest of this time towards the sunnah, the sunan of the Prophet uh, sallallahu alayhi wasallam in the salah. So the sunnah items or elements of the salah are those which are recommended, okay? And recommended items or elements are actions and verbal. So there are two types. There are the actions, the physical actions, removing uh, some body parts physically. And there are the verbal. And technically, you're moving body parts with this one as well, with your tongue and your lips. Because again, remember, verbal is something that you are speaking or reciting. The prayer, your salah, is not invalidated. It is completely correct. Even if you leave any one of these out, whether it is by mistake or intentionally, it doesn't matter what the reason is. If you miss any of these, your salah is completely valid. There is no uh, prostration of forgetfulness or anything like that. So you can consider these. You can consider these items that we're going to talk about as optional. However, <clears throat> however, the bottom of this slide, don't forget that we always talked about aim for perfection. This is so, so critically important um, that I want to really take a minute to stress this. Our salah is not perfect. 
I, I hope that all of you will agree to that, right? We will all have many shortcomings in our salah, whether it is how we are standing, whether it is uh, how we are reciting, maybe our tajweed is not perfect, maybe uh, it is our concentration, our khushu in our salah is not all there. Um, so many different factors that will um, uh, reduce the level of perfection in our salah. So we know this for sure. And we also know from various ahadith that we have talked about in the past that you are not guaranteed to get full marks for your salah. You will discharge the obligation when you perform the salah. Meaning your salah, if everything is valid, you've got the shurut, you've got the preconditions, you've got the arkan, you've got the wajibat all done, your salah will count. But how much reward will you get? We don't know. So think of a test that you do in school. Think of an exam that you do in school. And sometimes on those tests and on those exams, you get bonus questions. Now, on a test or an exam, there is a probability, there is a chance that you can get 100% meaning you got everything right. And if you do the bonus questions, you can actually get more than 100%. And the same applies here. However, if you get some of those questions wrong on the test, but you get and you get some of the uh, bonus questions correct, you could still end up with 100%. So whatever shortcomings we have in the rest of our salah, we can very easily very easily work towards gaining these bonus points, if you will, these bonus rewards by performing the sunnah, uh, and the sunan actions and verbal actions throughout the salah to try and compensate or try and perfect our salah. The other thing to consider um, is that no matter what we do, we're trying to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the definition of our worship, essentially. And the best way to do that is what? Is to follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the commands that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us numerous times throughout the Quran is to obey Allah and obey his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When it says to obey the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that means everything. And when the Prophet Wasallam says, pray as you have seen me pray. Pray as you have seen me pray. What were some of the things that we saw or, or the Sahaba see the Prophet Wasallam doing? They are these things that we are going to cover. These optional things that we're about to talk about, these recommended things that we're about to talk about, inshallah, are within the Salah of the Prophet Wasallam. So if we are to fully obey that command to pray as you've seen me pray, then we must include all of these. And we should not. They are. They are 100% optional. But we should not consider them optional. And I'm going to just explain really quickly why and before we move on. Because if we look up to the Prophet ﷺ as our role model, as we should, that is what we are supposed to do as Muslims then we have to try our best to copy and emulate the Prophet ﷺ. We spoke about this at length. I think it was in November or, or perhaps even December of last year when we went through this and talking about the identity of ourselves as Muslims and such. Um, but it is absolutely critical. And, and the reason I'm stressing all of this right now is because, again, when we look at this and we say, oh, it's sunnah, it's recommended, but it's optional, then we'll often hear saying, yeah, but it's just a sunnah. Don't, don't devalue these at all because these are so critical in us following the command of Allah to follow and obey the Prophet wasallam, who said to pray as you have seen me pray. So with that, inshallah, let us all uh, make an intention now and even ask Allah that Allah allow us to aim for perfection to, in our salah, in every aspect, including the sunan uh, actions and uh, verbal actions within the salah. So let us go through these. There are um, three slides that we have, which list out the 
uh, verbal and action sunan inshallah and uh, we'll try to go through as many as we can inshallah just as a as a sort of forward looking so you know one of the things that we have not spoken about yet uh, we've talked about you know ruku being from the arkan and sujood being from the arkan and uh, saying allahu akbar and, and all of these different things that we've talked about and the things that we're about to talk about we haven't talked about how in detail we haven't talked about the ruku and the sujood and the standing and these positions and so on in terms of what it looks like physically what does it look like so inshallah uh, either next class or the class after that we will be going through that in more detail we will also be looking at a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam related to these items to these elements in the salah so that it's one thing that i'm just telling you all of this right it's one thing that we're going to talk about saying dua istifta at the beginning dua of the salah it's one thing i'm going to tell you that you have to perform wudu is one of the preconditions and so on and so forth but should you be taking my word for it not really truthfully not really you should be looking at what it is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding and based on what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is commanding then that is what we should be uh, uh following and that is based on what the Prophet has told us in the Ahadith or through the Sahaba that is recorded in the Ahadith. So the first item here is Dua Istifta. This is, uh, sometimes people refer to this as the Sana. Um, this, is, this is the Arabic version of it, if you will, what it is called. It is called Dua Istifta Al Istifta. The opening du'a and so after saying the opening takbir takbir at al-ihram which is from the pillars we say subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika wa tabarak kasmuka wa ta'ala jadduk wa la ilaha ghayruk which means glory and praise be to you O allah blessed be your name exalted be your majesty and there is no god worthy of worship but you um so essentially if you will this this du'a is praising allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is the beginning of our salah. And actually, let's take one step back. Saying Allahu Akbar is the beginning of the salah, which is also praising Allah. And then you continue with dua al-istifta and, and praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then as Allah has commanded us in the Quran, that any time you recited the Quran, before you start the recitation of the Quran, you should be starting with the da'ud. You should be saying, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim seeking refuge with Allah and that is the second point here and then because you are about to recite a surah from the beginning in this case surah al-fatiha then you should be saying the basmala which is bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim remember saying bismillah is just that bismillah saying the basmala is bismillah ar-rahman ar-rahim so those are that's the differentiation between the bismillah and the basmala so in this case the sunnah is to recite the basmala and then we would recite what i mean no we start surah al-fatiha remember this is just the sunan so surah al-fatiha has already come where in the arkan of the pillars but after you have completed reciting surah al-fatiha then you say i mean um, and that is again from the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. One uh, one point on this, and this is a very, very, very common mistake people make. Um, and I don't even know if mistake is the right word, to be honest. Perhaps it's not even mistake. Um, maybe just out of habit, let's say. I don't want to call it a mistake because it's not wrong per se. Um, if you are not praying, if you're not in Salah, like right now, you're just sitting here, you're listening, and you recite Surah Al-Fatiha, okay, outside of Salah. Majority of the time, people will say, Ameen, at the end. The Ameen is in the Salah. It's not outside of Salah. In the, in, when you're reciting, when you look at the Mus'haf, when you look at the Quran, and you're reciting Surah Al-Fatiha, there's nowhere it says Ameen. It doesn't say Ameen anywhere. Now, that's why I'm saying it's a mistake because it's not there. But the reason I'm also saying it's not a mistake is because it is a dua. And when you recite a dua from the Quran or other than that, you can say ameen after that. 
So it's also not a mistake, but it's an unconscious mistake or uh, addition that we make, which is acceptable, inshallah. Um, but it's interesting because everybody knows Surah Al-Fatiha and you say, I mean, after it in the Salah. So everybody translates that into life as well. And so whenever uh, you yourself recite Surah Al-Fatiha outside of Salah, or you hear somebody else reciting Surah Al-Fatiha outside of the Salah, you hear people say, I mean, sometimes, um, you know, I've gone to the masjid and I'm I'm late and I and I'm I'm run to the uh, wudu to perform wudu, and the salah starts. The salah starts. And I'm performing wudu. There's other people maybe performing wudu, or, or I'm walking towards the musalla to join, and the imam finishes surah al-fatiha, and I see people that are either performing wudu or walking again towards the musalla, not in the salah, and they say, I mean. And it's funny because you're not in the salah. There's no I mean right now. Now, again, like I said, it is a du'a, so it's not wrong. But it's something interesting to note. Khair, inshallah. Let's move on to point number five. And that is to recite a surah after Surah Al-Fatiha. That is from the Sunan. Now, this is not restricted to the first and second rakah only. This is not restricted to the first and second rakah only. This is something that most people will do is only in the first and second rakah after Surah Al-Fatiha we recite another surah. But if you are in a third or fourth rakah, let's uh, let's say we're praying uh, Dhuhr or Asr, you can recite another surah after Surah Al-Fatiha. There is nothing wrong with that, inshallah, and it comes in it's from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The next item here is reciting out loud. Now, I want to clarify out loud because I've been saying this whole time that verbal actions within the salah must be recited, must be spoken, which means your lips are moving, your tongue is moving, you have airflow coming out of your mouth. And so therefore, therefore, that is also out loud. But this out loud is referring to out loud, like loud, like so people, other people can hear. Whereas in your other salah, um, you can be reciting loud, but not uh, where other people can even hear you, but it is recited. Okay, so just understand the difference here that we're, we're talking about. Um, for all of the actions, they must be recited, spoken. It doesn't have to be very loud enough for perhaps you to hear, but not necessarily for others to hear. But this reciting out loud during Fajr, Maghrib and Isha, the Fard Salah, specifically referring to the Fard Salah of Fajr, Maghrib and Isha, that the the Surah Al-Fatiha and the Surah after that that you recite is to be done out loud in the first two rakah, or in the case of Fajr, the only two rakah. Um, saying the Tasbih, when you are bowing and prostrating, meaning in Ruku and Sujood, more than once, more than once. So this is referring to what? Subhana Rabbi al Azim in the Ruku, Subhana, Subhana Rabbi al Ala in the Sujood, but more than once. What is once? It is from the Wajibat, it is from the obligatory actions. More than once is from the Sunnah of the Prophet. Saying, Rabbi clearly. Um, oh Allah, forgive me, more than once between the two prostrations, because once is where? Again, in the wajibat. So saying it more than once is uh, from uh, in the sunnah. And the last item here is saying the dua, saying a dua before the taslim. So you say your attayyat, you send the uh, salat and salam on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and then before you say assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, you recite dua. Which dua? Any dua. How many dua? As many as you want. This is a great opportunity for us to enhance our salah. Um, we'll talk about in more detail, inshallah, in, in future lessons, but the um, uh, from the salah, making dua in ruku, in sujood, and just before the taslim are three opportunities we should be taking advantage of. 
These are three opportunities, three positions in the salah where it is encouraged for us to make dua to Allah for anything that we want or that we need. Ideally, ideally, the dua should be from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, meaning dua that are well known to us by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ya muqallibul qulub, thabbit qalbi ala deeniki. O Allah, uh, O oh, oh, turner of hearts, uh, make my heart steadfast on your religion, on the deen of al-Islam, for example. Um, or any, any other dua, any other dua we can recite. However, and you can recite as many as you want. However, <clears throat> in ruku and in sujood, in ruku and in sujood, you can make as many dua as you want. However, they cannot be recitation from the Quran. The Prophet ﷺ forbade to recite the Quran in ruku and in sujood. So your dua should not be from the Quran. Now there is some difference of opinion on this. Um, so for example, uh, in the Quran is a dua, Rabbana atina fid dunya hasanatan wa fil akhirati hasanatan wa qina adhab nar So you should not recite this in your sujood, for example. However, some of the scholars said, you can, you can change it. So instead of Rabbana atina, you say, Allahumma Rabbana atina fid dunya uh, to the end and that is acceptable because now you are not reciting the ayah from the Quran and instead you have converted this into a dua specifically so something to be mindful of uh, from something that we can take advantage of something we should take advantage of our ruku and our sujood should be lengthy the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam comes in the hadith and I don't have it in front of me but the the, the meaning is is uh, roughly that the the uh, ruku and the sujood of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would be as long as his standing in fact all of the positions that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam would be in would roughly be about the same time now this is not all all the time so obviously if if you know in the hadith where the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recited Surah Al-Baqarah and Surah Al-Nisa uh, uh, Al and then Surah Ali Imran in that order, in that order, so Surah number two, Surah number four, then Surah number three, um, in, in one in one uh, Salah, then uh, obviously the Ruku and the Sujood are not as long as the recitation, but in general, the Ruku and the Sujoods were lengthy. And the reason they're lengthy is because there is Dua. Plenty of dua. So remember this, take advantage of this. Now, point number nine here, the reason that why I got onto this topic is saying the dua before the taslim. Again, make as much dua as you can. Take advantage of this uh, opportunity. Here you can recite from the Quran. There is no issue. Here there is no issue with that, inshallah. So, um, you know, this is this is these are moments, again, like I said, the, the salah is a discussion between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <clears throat> it is something that um, we should be taking advantage of. We we need to take advantage of. You know, um, when you when you are working at a job and you want to get a raise, you want to get a bonus, you say to your boss, you say, you know, hey, I want to speak to you. And they say, okay, well, I don't have time for you right now. I'll let you know. So you go back to work and you're doing your work and then the boss comes and says, hey, I have five minutes. You want to come and talk? What do you you drop everything and go rushing over and you want you want your boss to pay attention to you and you want to tell him all the reasons why you deserve a raise or a deserve a bonus and you'll you'll plead your case this is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is no comparison for allah and not only is allah allowing you to converse with him directly allah is forcing us telling us commanding us we must converse with allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Try doing that at a company with the owner of the company. Try doing that with the prime minister or a president or a famous hockey player or basketball player or any famous person. Try go and approach them directly, even once in your life, let alone five times a day. You don't get that opportunity. And if you do, it's very, very rare. And then when you do, they barely listen to you. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who is all seeing, all knowing, all hearing is commanding us 
to have this conversation with the one who can actually provide you with what you need. When we go to our boss and ask for a raise, they, they don't control that. They are only the means. They are only the in-between. It is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that provides the risk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the provider. And so we have to use our salah to ask from Allah. Right? Don't let your salah become a mechanical, ritual, ritualistic um, um, event in your life where you just stand up and mindlessly proceed through the salah. We need to understand what it is that we're saying throughout the salah. I don't have translations for everything here. Um, you know, some things I have and, I, and others I haven't. But we need to learn them and memorize them and feel them and internalize them and actually, you know, put them into practice and feel it when we're speaking to Allah in our salah. So, any questions on the verbal sunnah before I quickly move on to the uh, action sunnah? And there's two slides on the on the action sunnah, inshallah. Okay, alhamdulillah. I'm assuming you can all hear me still. It's hard to uh, talk to a microphone and computer when I can't see anybody and I can't, nobody gives any feedback, no questions, nothing. Can somebody at least uh, just uh, type, yes, you can hear me or just raise your hand or something. Okay, alhamdulillah, jazakallah khair. Okay, so action sunan. Um, Again, we're going to go through in the next class or the class after that, inshallah, in more detail of how okay, these are to be performed. But for now, we'll just talk about them. Um, just again, just so we're familiar with them. And we're going to repeat all of this over and over and over again. Because just because, look, if we're not used to it, uh, repetition, inshallah, like they say, practice makes perfect. Right now, this isn't practice. <laughs> this is just theory. Practice makes perfect is up to you to implement into your salah, inshallah. Um, so, raising the hands when saying the opening takbir. Now, this is interesting. SubhanAllah. Your salah is 100% completely valid if you stand with your hands by your side and you say Allahu Akbar without moving a single muscle other than your mouth and your tongue. All you say is Allahu Akbar. Your hands have not moved. Your salah is valid. Because raising the hands is not from the arkan, it is not from the wajibat, it is from the sunnah. Now, does that mean that's how we should pray? No, absolutely not. We should be performing the salah as best as we can and as closely resembling the salah of the Prophet wasallam as possible. Um, but again, these are points that we should know that in case we miss them, Right, Because inshallah, we're all going to try to make sure we do these to the best of our ability. But in case if we miss them, there is nothing to be done. There is nothing to be compensated. Uh, hopefully you feel guilty and you feel bad because you've missed an opportunity to gain reward um, for performing a sunnah. But you learn by making mistakes. And that is uh, inshallah what would happen. The second is raising the hands when going into ruku'. So you raise the hands when you start the salah, you say Allahu Akbar, you raise the hands and then you put them on your chest. Um, and the second action, sunnah action is to raise your hands when you say Allahu Akbar to go into ruku. And then when you say Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, point number three, when you are raising, uh, rising up from the ruku, then you again raise your hands. And number four, you drop your hands, meaning you don't put them on your chest at this time. So when you come back up from ruku, you raise your hands, but you don't uh, put them on your chest. Instead, you keep them by your side. Um, I guess these are somewhat out of order. <laughs> number five should have probably been after number one. Um, but khair inshallah. So placing the right hand. So this is when you have, uh, when you are standing, you are placing your right hand over or on top of your left hand. Your left hand is on the bottom. Your right hand should be on the top. Number six, looking towards the place of prostration. 
almost the entire salah, your eyes should be laser focused on where your forehead will be in sujood. Almost the entire salah, your eyes should be laser focused where you will be making sujood. Um, the entire salah almost. And I'll tell you, there is one spot where you don't and, and there's a different sunnah for that. But, you know, definitely don't be looking around. Definitely don't be looking around. But if you do, your salah is not invalid. Your salah is not invalid. But it is um, very important that you are looking towards the place of sujood. When do you not look towards the place of sujood? There's only one time when this is, when this is true, and that is when you are sitting uh, in tashahud. When you are sitting in tashahud, at that time, you will be looking at your right hand index finger. At that time, you are looking, your eyes should be focused on your right hand index finger. Um, okay, then there is um, number seven, standing with the feet apart. Your feet should not be together. Now, subhanAllah, I've heard misinterpretations of hadith because the Prophet ﷺ, before he would start the salah, he would often call out to the people certain things and at different times, different things. Um, and of them, there are things like where the Prophet ﷺ would say to straighten the rows because straightening the rows is part of perfecting the salah. Other times, the Prophet ﷺ would say things like, Stand feet to feet, stand shoulder to shoulder, stand knee to knee, stand ankle to ankle. Imagine how tight you should be standing when you are forming the rows and there is no COVID restrictions because right now with COVID restrictions, we're standing six feet apart. But this is how we're supposed to be standing. Now, when the Prophet says stand feet to feet, that means your foot against the next person's foot beside you. Some people say, no, this means your foot against your own foot. So you have to stand feet to feet where your feet are touching each other together. That's not correct. We're talking about in jama'ah, when you are praying more than one person, you're standing in a row, you're standing side by side, then your foot should be touching their foot. Um, so make sure we understand this clearly that this is this is where that misunderstanding comes from of of why some people will stand with their own feet uh, so tight together. Sometimes I've also heard some uh, somebody explain that they, you know, if you stand with your own foot against your own foot, you may lose your balance and tip over and fall. So to compensate, then we separate our feet just a little bit, just to get balance. But you don't go very wide so that you're touching the other person's foot because you have to stand your own feet to your own feet. And I'm like, subhanAllah, this doesn't make sense. Either you believe that you have to stand with your own feet to your own feet, then do that. Don't make excuse for, um, you know, that, oh, I might tip over and fall. Why the Sahaba wouldn't tip over and fall? You are a different human being or something. You have different physical abilities that you will tip over and fall. Or... You stand feet to feet with the person beside you. Okay. Now there's an interesting question here. Is that same for women too? Subhanallah, this is a very interesting question. There is a difference of opinion. That's the simple answer. There is a difference of opinion on this. I will say this. The hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is very clear. Pray as you have seen me pray. The Prophet ﷺ did not say, O oh, men, pray as you have seen me pray. Women, you pray differently. Old people, you pray like this. Young people, you pray like that. Nothing like this. The hadith is clear, concise, simple, to the point. Pray as you have seen me pray. That's it. Now, there are 
other opinions on this. There are other ahadith that people will make reference to. I don't have them in front of me, so I, I don't want to speak to them. Um, but often the the main point is that people say, but no, those positions are not uh, befitting for a woman to be in, or um, what if a man is looking, then it's not appropriate, and so on and so forth. First of all, there should be no man that is watching a woman praying her salah uh, other than her mahram inside of her own house. The ideal place for a woman to be praying is in a corner of her house. This is from the Prophet ﷺ. It is better for you to pray in the corner of your house rather than even going to the masjid. Subhanallah. You're not forbidden from going to the masjid. You're absolutely allowed. However, it is not preferred Friends, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has given to you the ease of praying in your home, in a corner of your home, where you can offer your salah. And in that situation, there's nobody watching you. If you are indeed in the masjid, as even at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there would be women in the masjid. And at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there was no barrier between the men and the women. They weren't on the second floor or in the basement or in another room and a wall in between, nothing like that. No curtain, no nothing. It was the Prophet ﷺ leading the salat in the first row, the men behind them, the children, the young children behind them, and then the women behind them. And so um, there is no man looking because they're all in front and you're facing forward. And after the salat, nobody would move. No men would move. The Prophet ﷺ would not turn around for a few minutes and give the women an opportunity to get up and leave. And then the Prophet ﷺ would turn around and recite the afghar and, and other things would happen. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would ask the Sahaba questions or ask if they had questions or if they saw a dream that they want interpreted and so on and so forth. But the point is, is that um, you know, there is there should be no difference between a woman's salah and a man's salah or a young person's salah and an old person's salah, other than maybe physical limitations or restrictions. But these are exceptions. And again, we're not going to talk about exceptions. So perhaps if you're old or you're injured and you cannot do a, an action, no problem. That's different. That's different. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us uh, rulings for exceptions. Um so I hope that answers the question. It was an excellent question and something that I was waiting for somebody to ask. So Jazakumullah khair. Um, so we were on point number seven or we had completed talking about point number seven. Um, I will add one more point actually on this in terms of standing with the feet apart. How far apart? Because sometimes you see people where their feet are very far apart. SubhanAllah. Um, in general, in general, if you want to try and sort of measure it, your feet should be as wide as your shoulders. Your feet should be as wide as your shoulders. Think of if you are standing in Salah, no COVID, and you are standing next to each other. You should be as tight as possible against the next person beside you. You should basically be forming a wall a wall so that it is solid so nobody can break through okay and if you're going to do that then your feet should be touching the feet beside the, the of the person beside you and your shoulders should be touching the, the shoulder of the person beside you and the only way that this is going to work all the way down is if your feet are as wide as your shoulders the same amount if otherwise if your feet are wider than your shoulders then the person beside you will have to have their feet less wider than their shoulders and so on and so forth. So um, in general, the rule is or the, the positioning is that your feet are as wide as your shoulders. Inshallah, I hope that makes sense. Um, when you are in Ruku, point number eight, when you are in Ruku, then there are several points here. Number one, your hands are on your knees. Your hands are on your knees with the palm of your hand on your knee and the fingers are spread apart, okay? And the other point is, is that your back should be straight. Um, this is your homework for everybody. The homework for you uh, and your family actually is to, to go into the ruku position outside of salah, so not during salah, just 
in your normal interactions with your family, ask somebody to look at your back in ruku. So you perform your ruku as you do in salah and ask them, is my back flat? How would you define flat? If you were to put a ball on your back, it shouldn't roll off. It should not roll off. That's flat. Now, you might not, you might not be there. Most people will have a huge arch, a huge arch, like a huge mountain on their back is how their position is. Uh, again, I'm not talking about if you have back problems or something like that. This is not for you. Just regular, normal, healthy people. Your back should be absolutely flat. Okay. Um, and you have to work at it. It will not come automatically. It takes effort to get there because you will need to learn how to move some muscles in your back that you may have never ever even knew existed in order to get your back straight. But it is not hard. It is not hard, but it is something that you have to practice. And so this homework for you is to ask somebody in your family to check your ruko, okay, and work towards getting it to be flat if it is not considered flat, okay? Another thing you can try is also take like a broomstick or something and put it on your back lengthwise and see if it is uh, if it sort of wobbles up and down on your back or not, or if it is flat then it should be completely touching your entire back. Uh, okay, moving on to point number nine, sujood. Um, your sujood needs to have, or should have, I should say, all of your body parts firmly on the ground, all the seven bones. Your elbows should be away from the side of your body. Now, if you are in jama and and again no COVID and you're you're up uh, um, shoulder to shoulder, feet to feet with the next person, then your elbows may be close to your side because you're not going to go poke the next person with your elbow. Okay, but at the same time, you need to know that other than that, other than if there's a if there's a physical restriction, then your elbows should be away from your sides. Your belly should not be touching your thighs. When does this happen? When you go into sujood and you are, uh, your head is very close to your knees. So imagine you're in sujood. Now imagine if you push your head forward, you're going to stretch forward. Okay. And as you stretch forward, you'll notice that your stomach comes away from your thighs. Or, and, and so they need to be away from your thighs, meaning you should be going um, a little bit more stretched out in your uh, sujood. Again, we will go through these with, with uh, diagrams in, in next class, inshallah, so you can start to see some of these more. Um, and the same with your thighs should you know be apart from your calves. And this is, again, if you stretch out, then you will see that this happens automatically. Your knees should be apart. They shouldn't be touching each other in sujood. Your feet should be upright on the ground okay the, your toes should be on the ground you don't have them your your feet up in the air and your hands um should be approximately where your shoulders are and your fingers should be spread out okay um okay let me just quickly go through these last four points inshallah and then uh, we will conclude the class and as i said next week inshallah we will try to go through the uh, some of the actual positions and, and go through the ahadith for some of these um, number 10 is an interesting one and i don't know how to explain this uh, using words is very difficult for me to explain this so when you are sitting in tashahud in the final tashahud um you should be i think i'm just gonna wait till we get to the diagrams I, I i don't know how to explain this in an easy manner verbally so forgive me for that i'm gonna skip over it um let's let's go on to number 11 placing the hands on the thighs um so when you are sitting uh in in a sitting position so either between the two sujood and or in the shahud then your hands should be on your thighs 
and your fingers should be together, not spread out. Okay. Um, your fing your hands should be on your thighs, not on your knees. On your thighs, not on your knees. I see often people's hands are so far forward that it's basically on their knees at that point. No, it should be on your thighs. Um, and so be mindful of that. In Tashahud, you are also making a circle with your middle finger and your thumb. Your middle finger, so not the index finger, not the first finger, the second finger, and your thumb. If you touch those two together right now on your right hand, you'll see that it forms a circle or can form a circle. That circle should exist. And your first finger, your index finger, should be pointing forward, not just slightly up, pointing forward. Okay, and again, we'll go into diagrams. When you are remembering Allah, when are you remembering Allah in the tashahud? The entire tashahud. From the beginning when you sit to the end after you complete assalamu alaikum warahmatullah, assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. Because even that is part of remembering Allah. And then the last point is turning to the right, turning your face, your head, I should say, sorry, turning your head towards the right and towards the left when you say the taslim, saying, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, to complete the salah. Now, I do want to highlight here a very important point that there are some differences of opinion amongst the scholars, okay, regarding some of these, these elements. Uh, what some people, some scholars say is obligatory, wajib. Some others might say, no, it's sunnah. Or what somebody says is sunnah, they might say, no, it's wajib, and so on and so forth. And this is some details that go, uh, you know, people go into in the discussions of fiqh. So if you hear other than these, it does it mean that these are wrong? No. Does it mean that they are wrong? No. No, we, we don't have any reason to bicker or fight about this at all, at all. What we should do is look at the hadith, and that's what we're going to do, inshallah, next class. We're starting next class. Um, look at the hadith of the Prophet wasallam to be able to fulfill the command to pray as you have seen me pray, and follow it to the best of our ability, based on how the Sahaba understood it and implemented it in their lives and taught it, and how it has been taught to us by the scholars of Al-Islam, and that is what we should follow. Simple like that. If somebody is doing something different, we try to, to clarify for them with the evidences, we explain to them, and then that's it. The, we leave that situation for Allah uh, between them, that person and Allah, and we do our best. But first and foremost, we need to work towards perfecting our salah. So inshallah, starting next week, we will start to go through the actual positions of these. We'll start to look at the ahadith for all of these. Um, and we'll also start, uh, maybe we'll start the class by looking at the complete flow, all of the different elements of the Salah, from the Arkan to the Wajibat to the Sunan um, of the Salah, and the verbal and the physical actions, and, and just not a chart, but maybe a bulleted list of all of those items, so we can see it in, in one structured flow, and then go into the actions and such. I apologize, there's not enough time for questions uh, today, but Jazakumullah khair and Mubarakullah fikum. If you do have questions, feel free to email me your questions, and inshallah, I will either respond to you in the email or we can save it for the next class and, and address them at the beginning of the class. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik, ashadu an la ilaha illa anta astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk, wa jazakumullah khair and Mubarakullah fikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.